Paul Martin Andrews was 13 years old in the winter of 1973 when his life would change forever. On January 11, 1973, in Portsmouth, Virginia, Paul was sent to a convenience store to pick up some milk. When he was three blocks away from the store, a man in a blue Ford van drove up next to him. This man, who would later be identified as Richard Osley, said he went by Pee Wee. Richard asked Paul if he would be so kind as to help him move some furniture at his brother's house, as well as take groceries to his deer box. In exchange, he would pay him for his trouble. Paul agreed and jumped into the van. Richard drove on a dirt road near Dismal Swamp when they approached the gate that was locked. Richard was bothered to see this and told Paul they would have to get out and walk to his brother's deer box to retrieve the spare key and open the gate. Richard told Paul he was going to need help and needed him to come with him. Paul then hopped out of the van and followed Richard through the woods, all the while hoping he had not put himself in danger. Once they reached the deer box, Paul was somewhat relieved to find a deer box actually existed and thought to himself the brother's house must be somewhere close by. The deer box was underground, made of plywood, and was approximately 8 by 4 by 4. That's 8 feet in length, 4 feet in width, and 4 feet in height. Richard told Paul that the deer box was underground so his brother could hide while he was deer hunting to presumably ease Paul's nerves. Richard went down into the deer box first and Paul followed after the sickening monster asked him to come down and help lift out some supplies. Paul stated that once he made it all the way down, Richard told him, I've got bad news for you, you've been kidnapped, and was holding a 12 inch knife. He also told him, you are not going to have to like this, but we are doing it anyway. Richard then ordered Paul to remove all his clothing and lie on his stomach as he slathered Vaseline on a 13-year-old boy. I'm going to spare you the graphic details, but you can imagine what happened next. Paul has said that was the first of four times that day. Not only did Paul endure being assaulted multiple times throughout the day every single day, but he would also have to endure getting beaten for eight days. Paul tried mul multiple times to talk to Richard in hopes of decreasing the amount of abuse bestowed upon him. However, his efforts were all in vain. Richard would continue with his daily routine of assaulting Paul. According to Paul, Richard would sometimes treat him like a human being and take him for walks in the woods and pilled campfires, but this did not stop Paul from being afraid Richard would end his life. Eight days later, Paul heard trucks park and began yelling for help, hoping that Richard was nowhere near the vicinity. The two men who were out rabbit hunting approached the voice and heard what appeared to be a young voice crying attempting to lift the trap door while yelling for help. They contacted police who responded, and when they arrived, they realized they were going to need bolt cutters. They called a rescue team in to cut Paul free from the chains that were holding him in the pit of horror. Police took a photograph of Paul while he was still chained. Paul would later say, and I quote, that picture tells a lot about what I had been through. The blackened eyes and broken nose, he stole my youth and my soul. He stole my innocence. He stole a lot from me. Damage done to my soul, emptiness in my eyes. The boy that came home was not the same boy who left that day. Paul was taken to OBC Memorial Hospital despite him pleading to take him to the hospital his mother and Weatherby worked at as a nurse. He said he remembers hearing his mom saying, Where is he? Where is he? And he remembers her coming through the door with her knees bent as if she was about to collapse. He jumped off the exam table and ran to her embrace. Paul would say he has minimal recollection of his reunion with his siblings when he arrived home. Jennifer, who is his younger sister, said, his eyes were blackened, his nose black, blue, and swollen. The bruises, lots of bruises. 
but most of all was a look in his eyes. It wasn't the boy I knew anymore. Richard was apprehended and was picked out of a lineup by Paul. Richard was a repeat offender and was scheduled to appear in a Portsmouth, Virginia courtroom on a charge of sodomy with a 14-year-old boy when he abducted Paul. During that time, he had also been on parole for abducting a 10-year-old boy whom he hogtied, assaulted, and left in the woods. Richard Osley was found guilty and sentenced to 48 years in prison and would blame Paul Martin Andrews for what happened. Richard said, my life was over. Marty saw to that. I will be his victim for the rest of my life or his. Paul said about Richard's statement, it was so unbelievable. It's my fault. The only thing he did wrong were the things I asked him to do. The things I asked him to do were all my ideas. I wanted to go with him. Come on. Within weeks of his rescue, trained medical professionals started probing him for answers. Paul also had a psychiatrist who called him a liar and told his parents he should be institutionalized. Also, a police officer told his parents to watch out. He might become a monster just like Richard Osley, insinuating that children who are abused grow up to become abusers themselves. After hearing these statements and comments from professionals, Paul began to refuse all treatment. In the days, weeks, months, and years following his abduction, Paul struggled with depression and self-loathing, which manifested itself in alcohol abuse, self-medication, and other destructive behaviors. Then Paul realized he was gay. This realization shattered him. He felt he had become his abuser. Thirty years later, Paul heard the man he was told he would never have to worry about again was set to be released from prison. This got Paul fired up to take action and do whatever he could to change laws and fund programs, which is exactly what he did. Paul went public with his story, which led to Gary Founds coming out and telling his story of his encounter with Richard when he was a 14-year-old boy in 1972. Richard was now facing charges in Gary's case. Richard pleaded no contest and was given five additional years in prison. The following year, on January, Richard was found unresponsive in his prison cell. His life had been strangled out of him by his cellmate who had warned prison officials not to place him in a cell with a child predator. Dewey Keith Venable had fallen victim himself as a child and swore he would take the life of someone like Richard if he ever got the chance. If you enjoyed this week's content, give it a like, subscribe, and make sure to hit the notification bell so you don't miss any uploads. See you next week.